Some of you have asked me questions about how I plan out my day, what I do week by week to see what kind of schedule I go by. And it's not as rigorous as you might think. I do kind of live day by day, week by week. I don't have like this really strict regimen that I follow because I try to allow myself some freedom, you know. <laughs> it's not like I plan out every minute of my day. But I do have like a general schema, I guess. If you, I'm not sure if that's the right, right terminology. But I do have something that I go off of. So I'll, what I usually do, if I have a lot on my plate, I'll make a to-do list. If I don't have a lot on my plate, I kind of just make a mental note of it when I wake up and say, okay, I need to do this, this, and this. These are the most important things. And then I go out and I do those things. But for this weekend, I have a number of things I want to get done, so I made a to-do list. So I thought I'd show it to you. So the first thing on the to-do list is I need to copy down some notes from my analytic number theory course. Because I teach uh, my business calculus class right before my number theory course. And the problem is, is that I have like 15 minutes between when that class ends and this one starts. And on Thursday this week, they had an exam, and <clears throat> I tried to make this the exam simple, but I know it's difficult for them because they're seeing the material for the first time. And a lot of them kind of went all the way to the end, and they still didn't, they still needed more time. So I decided to give them 10 more minutes, and I gave them the 10 more minutes, and a number of them finished, but there were still a lot that needed more time. And unfortunately, you know, that made what what that ended up doing is that I didn't have enough time to get to class for number theory. So I missed like the first 15 minutes of this class. And so I missed the notes and I took a picture of one of my friend's notes. So that's what I'm going to do today is get caught up on the number theory notes. And then uh, there's a class I'm taking called Problems in Uniqueness. The instructor for that class, I don't ever recall him mentioning giving exams, giving homework, or giving tests. Well, I think that's the same thing, ex exam or presentations. So I thought that all we ended up doing was just coming to class and listening to him. But he meant, he said something this week that sounds like he's going to give us a final. <laughs> and this is the very, I can't tell if he's ever mentioned this before, like a final exam, because I would have remembered that. I feel like I would definitely remember him saying that there was going to be a final exam. So basically what I'm doing now is that I'm going to look up his book. There's the author if you want to check him out. Pogorelov. I think I spelled it right, but I might have a letter missing there or somewhere. I'm going to look up his book and then just read through his book and take notes over it so that I'm not completely lost in the dark. His problems that he makes us do aren't that bad. He will tell us like when a problem is bad. But when we do problems in class, we they're generally not that hard. I should uh, I think he also got agitated with me this week because I wasn't doing the homework assignments he was given. So I'm gonna try and get caught up there. And I've been really slacking on the complex analysis because a while back he you know the the blue folder that's ah, buried here. I'm not gonna dig it out. The blue folder had that complex analysis test in it, and I'm supposed to be preparing for it and take it, and those are the five subjects I need to look over, and I've really been kicking that can down the road. So, really, I've kind of done theorems, so I've already done the theorems and the conformal maps. I need to finish up the contour integrals, and then I haven't even started these two, so that's not good. I'm somehow behind. I don't know why. And then... At the bottom here, we have conference details and homework. So one of the nice things about, or one of the exciting things about being in a PhD program, if you're at a pretty big school, which I'm at a pretty big school, it's a R1 school for research, uh, is that you get to go on conferences. So they'll have there will be a conference in a, you know, that's a couple states away, and then you'll get funding from your department uh, to fly out there and meet people and listen to lectures and network and hopefully that'll lead to a job somewhere. So me and two other people, maybe a third, I don't think that guy has signed up yet, but I think he will. Me and those three are going to travel in a few months 
to this conference and hopefully meet some new people and network and good things will come of it. It's pretty exciting. I've never actually been to a conference before, so I'm looking forward to it. And then the last thing, anyway, so when I say conference up here, what I'm saying is I need to figure out like housing arrangements, how I'm going to get there, set aside all that travel stuff that uh, I need to do, which, you know, it's new for me, so I need to figure out what's going to happen. And then for homework, my analysis instructor runs a off the books course where we don't get credit for it and we don't, uh, I don't want to say this. We don't get graded, but we don't get credit. It's kind of like an informal meeting between us grad students and him. I've mentioned it before on this channel where we go to it and then he, we talk about certain things and we bring up things to him and we can go over that stuff. So recently we've been talking about Fourier analysis and Fourier transforms. Before that, we talked about convolutions, which I brought up and a bunch of other things. We were talking about recursive sequences too. But anyway, we um, he gives us problems in that class and he wants us to do them at the board because the whole purpose, purpose is to sharpen our analysis skills. And so far, a lot of people have not gone up. <laughs> I've been up twice and I think uh, I can go up again uh, this coming Monday. I believe I solved one of his problems. But I'm just trying to not agitate him at this point, <laughs> you know, because I want to do his problems. It's just, you know, finding the time because it's also, you know, it's not graded. But still, I mean, he's doing us a favor by running this course because in theory, it's supposed to help us pass that qualifying exam. Anyway, so that's pretty much it. I live day by day, week by week. If there's something big that week, I try to, you know, plan around it. I look at myself stuff and say, okay, I need to do this. And then one other thing that I did not put on this list that I just now thought of is that I need to take notes for teaching. Notes for teaching. I need to figure out what I'm going to say to this, to my class. And I also got to get their tests graded, but I do have a grader for that course. And I handed him the tests yesterday. So it's kind of nice because there's 50 students in that class, and I think only like 40 of them show up. Well, it's probably less than that. I, <laughs> It's been dwindling, so I think it's closer to like 35 now. But at the very start of the semester, there was 50. But I think only 35 took the exam. And I don't think the... Um, I don't think it'll take too much, too long for him to grade. I don't. I want to be courteous to my grader and not give him you know, such a big headache over the weekend. But anyway, that's my schedule, more or less. I know that uh, there's the day in and day out, like I'm going to go to this class, this class, this class, and this class, but, you know, I don't really, that kind of happens automatically. It's really just like, how do I manage the time outside of the classroom is probably the more important thing. Like, how do you make sure that all of this gets taken care of? So today, so let's talk about what I'll do today, because this is more like a weekend thing. Um, I'll probably do the easy stuff first. I'll probably do the number theory notes, which only, that'll probably take like 15 minutes. And then I'll do, I'll probably do notes for teaching, so I don't have to worry about that. And then I'll probably try and do the homework that the analysis instructor gave us. And if I have some more time today, I will probably review my complex analysis, do some more con contour integrals. And then we'll just pick and choose stuff to do tomorrow. Maybe conference details. I'm just not really interested <laughs> in figuring out the conference stuff right now. Because I really just want to talk to the instructor that told me about it. That's And I didn't get any time to talk to him about it this week. So I'll probably ask him questions about it on Monday. Anyway, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. What's on the back of this? Oh, stuff. So I thought I'd maybe in the next 10 minutes show you a problem that I've been working on that kind of counts as a homework problem that I'd written in quotation marks. 
So the problem is about uh, probability that he gave us. And I, do, I think I have a solution for it, but it's kind of, I don't really trust my answer because it seems too simple. And I don't, know, I don't really see what I'm missing. And I went to my probability instructor and he helped me out with it a little bit. So I'm a little bit more confident with the answer, but still, I'm, I think I'm overlooking something. Because he can only help me as much as like I can properly define the problem for him. So what's the problem? So you pick three numbers at random between 0 and 1. And you want to answer the question, what is the probability that these three points make a triangle. It's kind of a strange, I've, I've kind of written the very bare minimum on the, on the, on the sheet of paper, but it, here's how you should think about it. You pick three random points between zero and one. So this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. And you want to ask yourself, what's the probability that when you put these three together in some orientation that they give you a proper triangle? And at first, you know, when I described this to, well, when he proposed the problem to me, I was like, wait a minute, that always happens. And I said that to, I showed that to my dad, and he said the same thing. And then I showed the probability instructor, and he said the same thing. But then if you pause for a second, you realize, oh, no, that's actually not true because they have to satisfy the triangle inequality, right? So what I'm saying is that x has to be less than or equal to y plus z, y has to be less than or equal to x plus z, and z has to be less than or equal to y plus x. So you have to satisfy the triangle inequality for the three points given, because you can choose three points where something here is violated. And my approach to this problem, so full disclosure, this is, what I'm about to write here may not be rigorous enough or may not even be right. But if it's not right, I'm not really sure what to do. I'm going to work on it more this weekend. And if I can get it solved, I'll present it before the conference, not the conference, but the seminar on Monday. So what did I do? What I did was... I turned it into a Calculus 3 problem. So here's my x, y, z space. Here's one, here's one, here's one. So when you pick three random points between zero and one, you're essentially picking a point inside this cube. You pick a point inside this cube. But this point has to be somewhere inside the cube that makes sense, right? Because it has to satisfy this. So let's, for the time being, just look at one of them. So let's look at this one up here. Um, do I want to use this one? Ah, it doesn't matter. Let's just use it. So x less than or equal to y plus z. If I subtract the x over, I'll get 0 less than or equal to y plus z. Subtract x. Okay. Now, I'm going to ignore the inequality for right now. Because the inequality will just tell me if I'm above or below a plane. And the plane I'm interested in is this guy. y plus c minus x is equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pl plot this plane and then use this to decide if I'm going to be above or below the plane. So if y plus z minus x is equal to 0, then obviously the origin satisfies this condition, right? Because 0 plus 0 minus 0 gives me 0. So I know that the origin, the origin is on my plane. Now I'm going to look at the corners. I'm just picking three nice points that I can get a grip on. So if y and x, if both y and x are 1, that means that I am at y and x are 1. I'm at this corner of the cube. If I'm at that corner of the cube, then z has to be equal to 0. 
So that means I am at that corner of the cube. I'm not like up higher, I'm not on this edge. I'm right here. So what I mean by that is anything that's on this edge of the cube will satisfy y and x equal to one. But z has to be equal to zero in order for this to make sense. So I know that that point is on my plane. And then I can play the same game. So I picked y and x to be one. So I can do the same with z and y, or z and x. If z and x are one, then I am on, so x is one and then z is one. So that means I'm up here. So that means I can be anywhere on this edge. But if y and x are one, that means z has to be equal to zero. Wait, I said that backward. If z and x are one, then y has to be zero. So that means I'm at this corner. Okay, so now I connect those three dots to make a triangle, and I'm gonna use a different color here. I have some Sharpies. We'll use pink or whatever color this is. So I connect these dots, hopefully this marker works. I probably could have picked a better one because it's the, the image isn't very good here, but you get a triangle inside here. But then we have to remember that the inequality is what we want to satisfy, right? So I want zero less than or equal to y plus z minus x. So because this is still at the end of the day a calculus problem, so far, so far this is calculus, I can just choose a test point, right? So if I choose um, this as my test point, that means that z and y are zero and x is equal to one. So z and y are zero. So z and y are zero. And then x is one, so that gives me negative one. So is negative one greater than or equal to zero? No, it's not. So that means the region of the cube that we're interested in is uh, the big piece, this big piece here. So that's just one. Uh, that's just one inequality. Remember, we have to satisfy all three of these inequalities. So if we go through each of these inequalities, we end up getting uh, a similar shape, except this triangle moves around. So, skipping those details, because it's the same exact calculation. Uh, we get this point here, we get that origin, and then the other one we get is over here. Uh, that's for the case where we have y here and x here. So, I'm going to use another color. Maybe this green one. I can't get my Sharpie open. All right. Please don't stop recording. Man, this is on there. Okay, hold on. There. This is old school YouTube. We have a budget of negative dollars here. So we connect this with this. We connect this with this. Connect this with this. And here's my plane. And one thing I notice is that uh, the two wedges only touch on this line here. And that line has probability zero when you're in three-dimensional space. So it's negligible at that point. And then we can choose a test point, but it's pretty easy to see. There's a, It's a symmetric argument every time. So if I choose this test point, that's the equivalent of choosing that test point. So you know that this wedge here is not what we want. We want the stuff that's inside. So what I'm saying here is that... Um, the good piece that I want would include this, but I can just subtract it off because they don't overlap too much. Or I should say, this tetrahedron does not overlap with that tetrahedron too much. So now I'm just interested in the in the space that they bound, right? I want this. I want the piece above the pink, piece above the green. So I can just subtract those two tetrahedrons. And then if I want the other inequality, you can pretty much imagine what's going to happen here. I don't know if this orange marker is going to work. But uh, we get the origin, we get this point here, that point here, and then now we connect the top so that we get this, this, and this.
yeah, this orange one's kind of dead. And then we subtract that tetrahedron, so you can picture what's going on here. Ah. Whatever, finish it later. So this problem kind of boils down to figuring out what the volume of the tetrahedron is, multiply it by three, and then subtract it from one. Because the volume of the cube is one. Then we set up our triple integral. So we settle up, integral, 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 dz, dy, dx. So I start at the end. I can see that x is going to go from 0 to 1. And then I notice that my x value is at minimum 1, but at most, or excuse me, y, my y value. My y value is at minimum 0, and it's at most y minus x using this line here. And then for the next integral, it's at least zero, at most one minus x minus y. And I'm gonna skip the calculus part here. You can figure it out for yourself. I've done it before, it's just a matter of time because I'm at 20 minutes so far. But if you evaluate this integral, you'll see that the volume of the tetrahedron should be one sixth, which means that in theory, my answer is gonna be one minus three times one sixth which gives me one half. And I'm gonna put question mark here because this problem seems a little too simple. And knowing him, he likes to ask harder problems. So where is my mistake here? I don't know, I'm not claiming there is one, I'm just saying this seems a little too easy. And I know I can ignore the parts where the tetrahedron overlap because they have three-dimensional Lebesgue measure zero. And I know that these three tetrahedrons don't overlap too much. They, they overlap on a set of measure zero. So I'm really just figuring out what the volume of this, let's see, one, two, three, what, what? One, two, three, four, five, six sided shape is. And supposedly it's one half, which means that half of the time you're gonna get three points to make up a triangle. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I've been working on. I'm not, again, I want to emphasize this because I don't want people screaming at me too much. I think it's correct. It could be not correct. There may be a detail that I'm overlooking, but this is just what I've been, and I haven't got to work on this problem too much. I pretty much did this in like an hour uh, earlier this week. So I'm going to continue to look over it. Hopefully I'll see where I've made a mistake, if any. Got to quit being so wishy-washy. And I'll see you in the next video.